right, so today I'm going to be talking about Serpent, which is a really awesome library that lets you make an API really, really simply. So to start out and motivate this, uh, a lot of us probably have written APIs in the past, and we know that there is a lot of tedious work involved in that. You have to interpret network requests and unpackage them, parse all the information out, deal with any errors that happen from that. And then when you want to send a response back, that you have to go through the same process again a lot of times. So, and you know, that's also very tedious. And then when you want to implement the client side of your server, you have to do a lot of the same work again. And so obviously if we could avoid some of this work, that would be really useful. So Haskell's answer to this basically is the servant library. And before we really get into it, let's just set up our, so let's talk about the fundamentals of what's going on with this library is that we're going to end up describing our API as a type, which is something that's a idea that's really sort of unique to Haskell. Um, we're going to be defining our handler functions in terms of the business types of our applications so that we're going to be able to avoid having to really deal with the network types at too much of a low level. And we're also going to follow the principle of don't repeat yourself. We're going to use Serpent to create a, a structure basically, and we'll be able to use this structure to basically generate a lot of code for us that, so that we don't have to repeat ourselves. So yeah, we're gonna first talk about creating the different endpoints and the different combinators we can use to do that in Serpent, so how we actually construct this type. And we'll get a little more in depth once we've got the basics down. Once we do that, we'll talk about creating client functions that can call our API from the client side. We'll see how easy that is. Then we'll take a quick detour, go back to the server side, talk about authentication and how Servant handles that. And then we'll wrap up by talking about how Servant also makes it really easy for us to document our API. So start off, let's first, this will be a running example throughout the presentation. We'll just have this very simple user type. We have a name, email, age, very straightforward, a couple of sample users. I'll compose our database. Uh, just make a map, give them both an ID, have a list for them. So we'll, we'll just be referencing this type throughout, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so initially, we're going to describe our API with two very simple endpoints. One is just going to be a get all users endpoint. that will just return both of the users in our database, and the other will put a ID parameter on the URL, so there's the slash one over there, and that will just return a single user of our database based on that ID. So. That's the API we're trying to build. And we're going to use this essentially by using two different type op operators that sort of library provides. So this first one with the two angle brackets is what we're going to use to combine the different endpoints in our system. So I'm going to refer to it as E plus for endpoint plus. I'm not sure if the people who actually write server have a different name for it, but you can find one anywhere. Um, and then there's the second combinator with just the single angle bracket. That's how we'll combine the different combinators within a particular endpoint. I'll refer to that as C plus for combinator plus. Um, so I guess now we'll just sort of dive right in and look at, uh, this, is, this is the very simple description of that API. And obviously this is a little confusing if you don't know what's going on, so let's break it down and look at it piece by piece. So each line here that we've got in green is one of our different endpoints and we've join them together using the E plus operator in red. So this is you know, the basic structure of our API. We have different endpoints the user can send requests to, and we combine each of these with the E plus operator. So now let's get a little more in depth into each individual endpoint. The endpoints themselves are composed of a number of different combinators that are all combined with the C plus operator. So we'll go over each of the different types of these combinators, starting with the most basic combinator, which is just a simple string, which is a URL path component. So remember our, I'll uh, you go back. We had a slash API slash user, so that's really what these strings mean, is it's referring to those path components. If, for example, we wanted to add another path component slash all for our all users endpoint, that would just be very simple. We add another string and add it in there with the C plus operator. Uh, so the next next different combinator we'll look at is the capture combinator. This is how we can sort of put an object into the URL. 
as we did with the slash one over there. And the capture combinator takes two different arguments. We supply a string, that's sort of the name of that capture parameter, and then we supply a type. In this case, we're just going to use a simple int, but we can actually use whatever type we want as long as uh, that type has an instance of the from HTTP API data type class. So basically, it tells it how to parse the string into that type. Uh, so then the last component that we'll look at in this very simple API is probably the most important. And this is the, basically what I call the method piece. And the first part of this is obviously the constructor get. Both of our endpoints are get requests. So you know, we have the type of method there. And then the second piece of this is the list of content types that this endpoint supports. We'll get to content types in just a second. The last part is quite simply the return type of this endpoint. When we send the response back to the user, this is the type that's really encapsulated in the response. So now, so we're on content types. There are actually four different built in content types there's JSON, plain text, octet stream, and form URL encoded. You can also create your own content types. For instance, if you're using the Lucid or Blaze libraries and you want to return a HTML format of your data, you can. There are various machinations you can do within Servant to make your own content type. And what effectively this does is it says, okay, so our response is going to have this, it's going to have this particular format and you can use any of these types as long as you have the proper instances for the types that you're returning. So in this case, because we are returning a user, in the JSON format, we have to have a two JSON instance from the data.json library. Right? And as long as we have that, then this will just work. This also handles the, um, it handles putting the proper content headers in the response object. So we don't have to worry about that. It'll just say content type is application slash JSON. We don't have to uh, worry about that. So yeah, another nifty thing about how, the, how composable these APIs are is that we can sort of refactor different pieces of them. So remember that both of our different endpoints have slash API slash users. We can actually pull those combinators out and sort of distribute them over our other endpoints. This is just sort of a nifty thing that we can do. So now we're going to get into actually writing these server handlers, the functions that will actually reply to these. Oh, question was there a tick list the tick? Oh, the tick in here. So what so essentially uh, the different content types are, are each have their own data type. So if we wanted to, we could say JSON, comma, plain text, comma, something. So they aren't actually the same type, which means we aren't actually putting them in the same list. This, this list is not a value. It's actually a list of types effectively. And that's what the, that's what the boss basically means. It's, it's, it, it has to do with data kinds. Hmm? Just type of list. Yeah, so the, the second argument is basically a list of types that are that are valid for the response. Um, so yeah, so for server side handlers, um, we have, should first get acquainted with the handler monad because all of our going to use that. And there's really nothing particularly scary going on. It's just an accept to you over the a particular servant error type. So Server obviously provides a number of different errors, and we can throw those errors, as we'll see in a little bit. And then the last uh, part A, and that is just going to be our return type, which will be either user or list of users, as the case. And then, of course, this moment is built on top of I/O because you know if we're doing network requests, there's going to be I/O involved, and also a lot of our handlers are going to. You know, when you're writing in the real world, they would have to do some like interact with the database or making files or something like that. So, yeah, um, you can you can use your own monad instead of a handler monad. This is especially useful if, if for instance, you're always reading from a database in your requests. You could, you might want to like throw a, uh, for instance, SQL persist T in there. Um, and the way you do that ultimately is you create a natural transformation. Is what it's called. You define a function that will go from your target monad into the handler monad, and you just describe that once, and then you can just use your monad all the time. Uh, so yeah, so let's get into writing the handler functions themselves, and we'll just start out with the type signatures. The, there are no parameters on our all users endpoint. That's just going to return a list of users, very straightforward. And then with the single user endpoint, 
we had the signal capture parameter, and as a result of that, we're going to take an int as a parameter to the handler function. And then we're just going to return a single user at the end of that. So we're going to implement this toy example, so these are really straightforward. Um, but the interesting thing you know is that since we're in the handler monad and it's an XFT, we can throw our own servant errors in addition to the sort of default errors that we get if, for instance, the user provides malformed data, so we'll just take care of that for us. But yeah, you can also throw custom errors if, for instance, they try to access a user that does not exist. <coughs> so now we want to actually serve our API, and we do this by building something of the server type over our API. And we're actually going to create this object by combining our different handler functions using the E plus operator. And we're going, as long as we combine them in the same order, that we combine them in the API definition itself, then it'll just work out. And the next step is we're going to create a proxy for our API type. So again, since our API is a type and not a value, we have to sort of do this packaging of it so we can uh, pass it around to certain functions. And then we'll use the serve function over our API proxy and over our server. And then that gives us an application that we can just run over a port. And then we're done. Our server will be running. So now we're going to get. Oh, question. What happened with the uh, label data? Do they have the parameter? That will we'll actually end up using that uh, when we document the API. So that'll come up later. But, uh, I guess I should also again have a repeating question. The question was what do we do with the name label that we put on the capture parameter? And we'll use that uh, when documenting the API. It doesn't actually come up in uh, creating the server handler itself. So now we're going to create um, some slightly more complicated endpoints because there are obviously a lot of different things you can do when writing an API. So we're going to talk about query parameters, what we do with a request body, headers, that sort of thing. Um, so to start out, we'll go through query parameters. So let's say you want to put this parameter in there, age less than. You would, this is more or less what the URL would look like. And there's a common layer for that. It's called query param. You give it the name. And in this case, we do actually use the name. It's what will show up in the endpoint itself. And just like with the capture common layer, we're also going to supply a type that we want to ultimately receive in our function. And again, we're just going to use an int in this instance. And when we actually write the handler, it's actually going to show up as a maybe int because the user is free to either uh, supply the parameter or not. So we just have to handle the case that they don't. But after that, it's really very straightforward. Uh, so you can also provide a parameter list. So say we're filtering by name and supply both like John and Jane and whatever else you want. Uh, it's a very simple process. The, the commenter is just called query params, plural, s, uh, instead of query param. And same thing, we just supply a type. And this time in our server side handler, we're going to have a list of strings as our parameter. And once we have those, pretty straightforward. Um, and then the last query parameter is the, oh, I titled the slide, but that's okay, it is actually the uh, just a flag parameter. So query flag is old. We don't really need a type here because the only question is, is the flag there or is it not? And as you might expect, this is just going to show up as a bool in our handler. Uh, now we'll get into request bodies, which obviously you need to do if you're doing a put request or a post request. So just like how we had the get essentially as the method piece for all of our other endpoints, this will have, we have a similar constructor put. There's nothing else particularly complicated there. And then we have this rec body combinator. And just like the method piece, it requires a list of content types effectively. And the only difference there is that since now we're receiving in the request, we have to be able to sort of read that instead of write to it. So whereas with the method piece, you have to have a two JSON instance uh, for the JSON example. In this case, you would need a from JSON instance in order to use this uh, rec body combinator with our user class. Um, but once you have that, it does exactly what you expect, and we have a user parameter to our function. So. This is how we sort of update a user, except ignoring for the fact that this doesn't actually, the way this function is written does not actually do anything because we don't use the new map, but um, 
that's more or less how we, uh, we get a request body. So there are a few other common errors. You can put headers in your endpoints. These will show up as a MIDI text in your server side handler. You can also have raw endpoints. This is what you want to do if you're serving, say, CSS or JavaScript files. You would basically um, point the endpoint to that file and just you would return that file. And then in the, the latter part of the presentation, we're going to talk about a couple of different authentication commands and we'll get more in depth about those. So, yeah, this is what our full API looks like at the moment. And yeah, now we're going to go on to find functions. Are there any questions? Right. Yes, yeah. Similar question again. Yeah. So, can you go back one second? So, why don't I have to put text in front of the list of users? Oh, so at the, you mean, for instance, on like the filter flag at the very end? So, that is, so yeah, so list of users is the type that is being returned by it, whereas the second parameter is the list of types that we um, supply. That are that or that can be that are valid content responses, basically. So it's they're like subtly different uh, things. Types versus content. Yes. Uh, all right. So now we're going to move on to client functions, which is my favorite part of Servant. This is what really convinced me that Servant is really awesome because it's actually very easy for us to create functions that will then be able to call our API from the client side. So again, we want to deal in our normal business types. We don't want to have to get too down in the nitty gritty with uh, network requests and responses and that sort of thing. We don't want to have to repeat ourselves. We don't want to have to redefine the structure of our API. And so we can do this using the server client library. So first thing we're gonna do, we're going to import our server type and the proxy. And what we're going to do is we're going to define a different function for a different client function for each of our endpoints. So we're going to have almost exactly the same type as the server side handler, except that instead of being in the, in the uh, handler monad, it's going to be in the client M monad. But otherwise, these types are the same, and we're just going to define these types and for the moment leave them sort of unimplemented. Because uh, what we're going to end up doing. So we're going to create a pattern match. Again, we're going to use the E plus operator to combine our different client functions in the same order that we combine the endpoints for defining our API. And then we're going to set that pattern equal to the result of calling this function client over our user API. And that's it. That's all the code we need. This is actually going to more or less fill in the implementations for us as far as what these client functions should do. So we'll see how we call them in a couple of seconds. First, let's talk about the client M monad because we want to actually use these functions we need to know what's going on there. So the client M monad is more or less a reader over a client environment, which just has a network manager and the base URL of the API that we're calling to the server. So we can just create that. And then once we've done that, we pass that as a function to run client M along with whatever client function we are client the client action that we're calling, and that's it. That's all we have to do in order to call our API and get the response. So, really did not have to do very much work there. So, yeah, it's really cool. Um, any questions about client stuff? All right, I'll move on to authentication then. So, to be bothering us a little bit, we haven't actually bothered authenticating any of our different API endpoints yet. And authentication is usually pretty important when you're talking about an API. So there are actually two different paradigms of authentication in the server world. And they're sort of at the different extreme ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, we have basic authentication where the user sends some sort of information with every single request, either like they send the username and password with every request, or they, for instance, this would also work with JWT, uh, JavaScript web tokens for those who might not know. And then there's also, on the other end of the spectrum, there's generalized authentication where you can really do whatever you want. And it allows, if you're using something complicated like OAuth, then you need to uh, use a somewhat more powerful system. So first, we're going to get into basic auth. And just like the other things, we're just going to use a simple combinator 
to represent this within our API. We're going to use uh, it's called basic auth, and we'll supply a name parameter. The name is sort of the realm of authentication. So in case we want to have multiple realms, like um, we have one section of our API that only the admin should access, and another section that any logged in user can access, that the realm allows us to that. We're also going to supply a user type parameter to the basic auth comment layer that sort of says how the user is represented once they're authenticated. And it's very straightforward. Whatever type we supply will be the parameter that we get as part of our server side handler. So in this case, we don't actually use the user that's supplied, but it does let us know that that user was authenticated when calling this endpoint. And in order to use this, we're going to have to create what's called an auth check. This is more or less a function that takes a basic auth data object. Basic auth data is just perhaps username and password, uh, very simple. Um, so we take that as our input and we supply an auth result, which is either authorized with the resulting type we want or unauthorized. And uh, yeah, it's, it's also, it's gonna be an IO function in case we have to do database operations or something like that. But in this case, we're just gonna hard code some stuff. Um, so once we have our auth check, then we're going to create a context for, that will wrap that check. And then we will, instead of using the normal serve function, we're going to say serve with context and supply our authentication context. And then we'll have an authenticated API. So when we want to call this on the client side, it's actually very easy. We just in place of the basic auth combinator, wherever that is, uh, we'll supply a basic auth data parameter. So again, this just wraps username and password. And we just supply that as an argument to our client side function. So again, we are using the correct login information here. So we'll get uh, we'll get all of our users. And if we supply incorrect information, then server will just handle giving us a 403. So uh, any questions with basic authentication? All right. So now we'll move on to generalized authentication. Like I said, sometimes basic is not enough. Sometimes you don't want to necessarily send the same information with every, every request. Maybe you're using something like OAuth, that's more complicated. And so the request may need more information and the response might be more complicated. So this is gonna be the one time where we're going to sort of actually dig into the network types themselves, um, specifically the requests. Um, we're going to start by using the uh, the generalized authentication combinator auth protect, which only takes just the one realm parameter. Actually, we're going to do something different to sort of supply the representative type. Uh, we're going to actually use a type family to sort of fill, it, fill in that hole. And so there's the auth server data type family, and we're essentially asking, okay, what type represents the user? for authentication purposes. In this case, we'll just use an int for the ID instead of the full user type. And whatever type we supply will become the parameter in the server-side handler function. So just like how we made an auth check in basic authentication, we're actually going to, for generalized authentication, we make a handler. And this is a function that takes a network request. So Again, this is where you actually, you could analyze these specific headers within the request. You could do something more complicated with the body. Really the world is your oyster as far as doing whatever you need to do in order to authenticate the user and do any side effects you need to do. Um, I'm just gonna sort of hand wave and not put an implementation here because it, would just, uh, it can be however complicated you want it to be. But once we've created this off handler, then we do essentially the same thing we did with the auth check and we wrap it inside a context and then we serve our API with that context and we'll have an authenticated API. So on the client side, it's also going to be a little more complicated with generalized authentication than basic authentication. We're going to use a different type family this time, auth client data instead of auth server data. And we can fill in whatever data we would sort of pass in order to auth authenticate the user in this case, I, the sample I've chosen is uh, alias uh, JavaScript web token type. Although I, I should say, as I said before, that you could use basic auth with uh, JWTs, but we'll sort of roll with this. 
Now the type that we're going to supply to our client function, the parameter, is something a little more complicated called an authenticate rec. And what this does is it wraps a function that will take in that information, the sort of JW token type that we supply, and so it'll take that type from the type family and a request and supply the modified request. So in this case, we could take our token and make it do basically add a header to the request. So again, we're getting into more of the nitty gritty request type, but that's the price we pay for using generalized authentication. Um, and once we have wrapped this function, then we use the make authenticate rec function and then we can supply that to our client function. So we call the JWT header, and we call this on this string, which is clearly not a JWT, a JWT remotely, but that's okay. And yeah, that's how we call a generalized authentication. So uh, yeah, the last section that I'm gonna talk about is documenting our API. This is going to be absurdly easy. Well, I, I guess it's going to be a little, we're going to have to do a little more work than we did for creating client functions, but it's still really easy. Again, we don't want to repeat ourselves. We don't want to have to do anything that would be like re-describing the entire structure of the API because we've already described the structure of the API by creating a type for it in the first place. We are going to have to add some business logic descriptions because servant can't actually read our minds, but again, it won't actually be particularly difficult. Uh, so really what we have to do is we have to fill in instances of particular type classes that will allow server to generate documentation for us. So we'll go through each of these three examples. So for every capture parameter that exists in your API, you have to supply an instance of the user capture uh, class. So again, so we see here that we're providing a specific instance for capture on user ID. So if we had other different capture parameters within our API, then we would need a different instance for each of those, uh, each of those different strings. And we can see why, because we supply a name and a description of that parameter, and we'll obviously want different descriptions for the different capture parameters. Hmm. So but this is very straightforward for capture parameters. For params, there's a little more work because you have the three different types of params, but at the same time, we're still just supplying very basic information. We use the name of the parameter, a list of sample strings, a description, and then for the parameter example, we say what type of parameter it is, whether a normal parameter or a list or a flag. Uh, and then for to sample, anything that you have either as the result of a one of your HTTP methods or something that you use within a request body, you need a to sample instance. The only instance, uh, instance of that we have is our user class and you just use um, the sample instance, you just supply a couple of examples and it will just create those and format them properly. Oh, and I guess I did mention this, my, I didn't put a slide for this, but for if you have like the basic auth combinator, then you would need a, I think it's called two auth info, is the instance you would need for that. Um, yeah, so that's a detail that's slightly missing. But now, our goal now is going to create a different API that will sort of serve our documentation alongside our user's API. And because the type operators are like really flexible and really composable, we can actually just take our full user's API and add another raw endpoint to it, like this. We'll call that our full API. We'll make a proxy for it, just like we did before. And serving this is really not that complicated. Uh, the key thing up here with the docs uh, by string function is we use this docs function and we call that over our users API and then we do a little bit of uh, text manipulation we use markdown function because we want uh, markdown format and this gives us the byte string that represents a full documentation of our API and then we create a server over our full API which we, all we need to do is combine the function that serves our documentation with the old user server that worked for just the users at API. And then we serve our full API. And so now anytime a user accesses an endpoint that is not present 
in our users API, they'll see our documentation so that you know they'll know which which endpoints they should actually be calling. So that's a brief sample of what uh, markdown documentation looks like. Uh, so yeah, that is the last section. So let's do a quick summary. So start with servant lets us describe our API as a type, and this gives us a very uh, concrete structure. We create this type by constructing different endpoints, which have a number of different combinators we can use. And then we'll write a handler function for each of our different endpoints. And servant also then makes it very easy for us to write a client function that corresponds to each server side function. We, there are a lot of different cases where we can combine different things using this E plus operator. It's very versatile and very useful. And then we also, we went through authenticating our API. And as the last step, we showed how easy it is to document our API. So that's kind of the talk. I'll talk. There are even a couple of features that I didn't really go through. Can serve it just like you can generate uh, Haskell client functions. They can actually generate JavaScript code that you can use that that will access client functions that can call your API. Um, if you are if you are doing a Haskell front end with like Reflex FRP, I think there is a servant reflex library that makes it really easy to hook up with that. Um, there's also a serp library called servant panda that allows you to use uh, any documentation format you want. So lots of extra features. Uh, now I'm going to put in a couple of plugs. I do uh, write a blog Monday morning Haskell all some stuff every week, looking to uh, make some Haskell courses in the future. If you want to subscribe for that, the most profitable way to do that is to go to mondaymorninghaskell.com slash bayhack, and you can actually get all the code I made for this presentation and also the slides. So there's that. Also, I'll talk about my employer originate a little bit. We do a lot of, we work with a lot of awesome technologies. We are looking to create the AI native future basically by finding different ways to implement AI and machine learning into a lot of different projects. We do a lot of awesome partnerships where we work with other companies and help them build their products from the ground up. And of course, we're hiring. So uh, if you're interested in that, talk to me. And also, I do want to thank everyone who's involved in organizing the hack, especially Dan Burton and Erica in the back there. Thank you very much. Let's get a round of applause for... Yeah, also thank you to Chat for hosting us. It's been great. Uh, yeah, have a great time. So, uh, any questions? I uh, just wonder if you tried the Swagger um, library that goes with this. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if I tried the Swagger library, I have not, I've worked with some code that does use it, but I have not actually written the any Swagger code myself. But I suspect it's, I suspect it's good. So you, you said the, that you generate the documentation for the API, mm -hmm. and uh, let, let's say you have like uh, three API calls A, B, C, and you know that certain user, uh, regular user, doesn't have access to C endpoint. Will it be listed in the documentation? Yeah, so, so the question was, suppose we have different endpoints and certain users can't, see, can't actually access certain endpoints. The way the documentation works is that it will list all of the endpoints, but it will say what auth info is needed for each endpoint. So, yeah, I suppose, um, obviously, you might have admin endpoints that you don't want someone else to be able to see. So what you would want to do there is, um, again, because the types are like really composable, you could um, create one type that's sort of your public-facing API, and then another type is your private API. And then the documentation that you supply, you can just use the type that's the public facing API. But then it becomes rather rigid because you cannot really dynamically like have many different uh, types of APIs, right? So you, you have to define it up front. Well, yeah, as, as, as part of your API definition, you do have to say like what endpoints use what forms of authentication. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for showing up.